Hi, my name is Jason3kb, and today I'm reviewing the game based on my life, The Evil Within. Thank you to Bethesda for sending over the review copy. I also want to thank everybody for the feedback. Do you guys know how much it means to me that you comment below and we get into a conversation? That's what I want the show to be about. And future subscribers, I want them to come here and see that we've built a community over the last six years that care about each other. And that's the point of the show. So thank you so much for watching this video. How scary is this? Oh, evil. You know another game that's evil? <laughs> ah, survival horror. This is a good survival horror game based on the fact that I dare you to try to survive one race with the servers online. Good luck to you. <laughs> You're not gonna fucking do it. Let's get into the story of The Evil Within. You play as Sebastian Castellato, who is a detective, and he has two partners in crime. Now, I have these amazing notes I wrote below, so I'm gonna be looking at the notes and reading off that because I wanted to be super detailed. I actually wrote somewhat of a script for this review. I never ever do that, but again, you guys really, really, really deserve an actual review of the game because I have a feeling there's gonna be a lot of mixed reviews on this, but I do sway in a certain direction and I want you guys to understand why I went in that direction at the end of the review. Sebastian Castellano, he has two partners. Now, your two partners are Julie Kid Kidman. She's uh, kind of a typical female character in a Resident Evil game. She's got her badass side, she's got her cool side, she's got her side where she gets captured and you have to rescue her. Uh, yeah, she's a lot of fun. Then you also have Joseph Oda, who plays your primary uh, cohort in the game. Somebody who's going to be following you around a lot of the time, and I'll get into his AI in a minute. I asked you guys on Twitter and on Facebook before I filmed the review if you had any questions, and now I'm going to answer those as I go through the review so you guys can get all of what you want out of this. Now, first person asked this question. Andrew Dick asks, how long is the game? It's 14 to 70, 17 hours, I can't speak today. And you have to play this in two different ways. If you want to run and gun through a game and just shoot zombies in the face, well, you can do that. And I shouldn't call them zombies because this is not Resident Evil. I'll say deadies, or no, that's something else. I'll say ghouls. If you want to shoot the ghouls in the face in this game and just run through it, you can do it in about 14 hours. If you want to salvage things and get the most out of the boss battles and the, the most strategy in the boss battles, uh, you have to really search the levels to get, you know, upgrades, health, syringes, all that sort of thing. Green gel, we'll get into that though. Yes, there are jump scares that do work in the game. The beginning of the game, you start off really searching out this empty area. Uh, you're wondering where are you in the city and why is no one around? That's when you and your teammates discover the fact that somebody has murdered everybody at the insane asylum and it's your job to uncover that and just as you're about to open your case, your throat gets slit you woke up in the basement and now you're hanging upside down. That's where it takes some notes from Tomb Raider. And that's kind of funny because at the beginning of Tomb Raider, you're hanging upside down as well. And in this, you're literally doing the same thing. I think it does take a little bit from Tomb Raider, which is interesting and I kind of do like that. When I say this game is extremely original, not necessarily. In terms of the scares, yes, there are jump scares. But it also, I have to point out, the story is decent. It's not one of those like paint by number horror games. I did get a little invested into the characters, but not the main character. I kind of got invested into, I would say, the main enemy in the game. So that's a good point, but it also is a bad because I hope that I care more for the characters around me. Now, I did care about my secondary character, who you don't play as, but he follows you around. Now, his name is Joseph, and this is where I'll bust into the gameplay and tell you that the enemy AI on Joseph is so overpowered, it's like watching a, a murderer that's slightly slow, but will kill everyone eventually. But slowly will do it, but he'll do it. Kill somebody, I'm dying, help me, Joseph. He comes along, and he goes, I'll kill them. Ah, and he kills them. And it's it's like this tense battle that's happening next to you. Next to you, and I'm losing my voice. And it's it's awesome. I do like it, but it's not perfect. I have to say right off the bat, again, this game is definitely not a perfect game. It does have its flaws. I would also say graphically, as I get into that little aspect there, it's not necessarily the best looking game. But does that, is that really a fault in a horror game? Do you want something that's like completely stunning? Like, uh, you know, obviously the new Silent Hills that comes out, that's gonna look fucking insane. Now that 
game there is on the Fox engine. This game here is on something that I would say is a cross between, and unfortunately I don't like saying this because I really had hoped it would be better, but it's like looking at a PS3 game launch title all the way to a next-gen game, and it, it's just back and forth, and there's never a solid chunk of the game where you're like, wow, it is next-gen, oh, it is, no, and then you get disappointed by the graphics, but, you know, how important are graphics to you in a game? To me, in a game like this, not really, because you still get trapped in that atmosphere, you still get involved in the in the intensive motions of the characters as it plays out in the screen. So, I'll give the graphics... A... You know what, there's one more thing that bugs me. For some odd reason, this is a 16x9 game, but it's also extremely anamorphic, meaning that it has extra widescreen bars on the bottom and top. So if you look at this gameplay right here and up here and down here, the game is squished. Now, what does this do and why is this happening? A lot of people are going to assume that this was some sort of choice to make you feel like you're claustroph claustrophobic. I can't fucking talk. And, it, and you know what? It honestly does do that. Especially when there's moments where enemies are above you or below you and you have this sort of, I, I, I can't see them. I can't fucking look quick enough. That's another thing. For some odd reason, when you put it on the highest settings for the, uh, the actual uh, joysticks, you're hoping that you could, you know, put it on 100% and then you could swing around very like the the intensity of how quick you turn oh but no for some odd reason you put it on 100% and it still feels like it's at 50 so that's another kind of fault of the game where i wish you could turn quicker but you can't now Raphael from twitter asks in comparison to resident evil is it more like the first ones is it a mix of action like the fourth one and the fifth one or is it a mix of the two and Deacon also asks, how does the Evil Within stack up against the old school Resident Evil? In particular, how does it stack up against Resident Evil 4? Well, I'm happy to announce this essentially is Resident Evil 4. I mean, it really it feels like it's almost the same engine. You have a lot of the same camera angles. You have a lot of the same uh, weapons and very... <laughs> Well, one of the, I'll just say this, one of the enemies is literally stolen from Resident Evil 4, the dude with the chainsaw. Now, you remember when you played Resident Evil 4, if you did, that chainsaw dude, you never wanted to go up to him. He's literally the first enemy you kind of encounter in this game for some odd reason. So, to answer your question, I would say this plays mostly like Resident Evil 4. It has very subtle Resident Evil moments in it. Now, one of the coolest things in this game would be the ability to burn the bodies after you've shot the enemies or the deadies or the ghouls, whatever you would like to call them. Once they're on the ground, you can throw a match on top of them, which will disintegrate their body and give them zero chance of reanimating and killing you. Now, this system is a cool system when it works. At times, you can just stamp out their heads and not use the matches, or you can use the matches on a pile of bodies if you're smart enough to kill them on top of each other. Why are the matches here if I can just literally knock them to the ground and crush their heads in? Well, here's the important part of this game. You never ever truly know they're dead until you burn their bodies, and that's one of the things in the game that I really do like, because it raises the tension. The, ta the gauge on the tension really goes up when you clear out a room and you realize that, oh shit, I ran out of matches. You get the sense that these ghouls are going to literally reanimate behind you and kill you, and that does happen, and that's cool. So each mission will give you a cool little challenge. For instance, Julie gets kidnapped and put into a vat of water, and you have a limited amount of time to actually shut off the valves. So if you don't that, uh, get the valves shut off, as the enemies are attacking you, she will drown, you'll fail the mission. What's cool about this is though, you get to see a water gauge as you're going about that mission. So you get to see her kind of like, oh, she's about to drown and you see that gauge on screen. That happens in one level and it's kind of cool and unique to all of a sudden have this, this challenge where I, I, I haven't really seen it in the game before. So it was interesting to have these new challenges every mission. Here's a tip, when you use your lantern, make sure you hit R1, which puts you into stealth mode. Once you're in stealth mode, you'll see further into the distance with your lamp on. I have to highly suggest, though, there's something here that really bothered me. For some odd reason, they chose to put on this sort of uh, cinema filter that can be put on 
the beginning of the game. It's actually on automatically, which you can shut off, and you get a much sharper image when that is off. Obviously, yes, I'm not an idiot. It is made to dull the image out, to grain it out a little bit. Obviously, I know that from film, but unfortunately in this game, I don't like it on, and that's just my personal opinion. You can fiddle, fiddle with that yourself and figure it out. Me, don't like it, take it off. Now you're asking yourself, how do you save in the game and how do you upgrade your character? I have to say this, I really enjoyed the way you can upgrade your character because there's so many different trees you can take with four different abilities. Now, I'll, I'll get into that really quickly. So, to get into an actual save room, you do it through mirrors. So within the actual missions, there'll be a mirror that you come across and it cracks. You hold the X button on your PS4 controller and what that does is put you into the save facility. Now the save facility, I would say, is a psychiatric ward. I don't want to give too much away, but in the psychiatric ward, it's also kind of a mission in its own right, but it's also your safe haven. When you go into this zone, it goes into black and white most of the time. Sometimes it's in red, sometimes it's in different colors. But this will always allow you to save. You go up to a nurse, boom, you can save right there. Also within the save zone, you have your upgrade abilities. Now from your save location, there's this weird little chair you sit in. And it kind of reminds me of Clockwork Orange, where he's sitting back and his eyes are wide open. You sit in this machine, it looks like something from like Ghostbusters that goes on your head. Something goofy and you implant yourself with the upgrades. This is green gel that you collect throughout the game and it, it, it kind of like equals points. So you'll find like a little bit of it after you kill an enemy or a large bit of it when you kill a boss or you'll find it in some like, like secret zones. When you get this gel, you take it back to the save zones through the mirror and then you have your points system. So your point system adds up after collecting the gel. You use that and I'm gonna just read it off here very quickly because I took notes. Now, when you go into there, you sit in the chair, you get four different options on what you can upgrade. So one of them would be your abilities, which mean your life gauge, your sprint time, your melee damage, and your syringe recovery. Now the syringe recovery is interesting. It replaces your, your herbs from Resident Evil. You find syringes over the mission and you, you inject yourself and it's all in real time. So you have to be careful of the baddies as you're doing that. Some of the other abilities that you can uh, you know, upgrade here would be the weapons, the stock, and your agony bolts. Now, the stock would be, you know, your handgun, your shotgun, your sniper rifle, your agony bolts, your grenades, your syringes, and your matches. You can, you can actually upgrade the amount you can hold of those. Your agony bolts are what work with your, your uh, bow and arrow. So in your bow and arrow inventory, you'll have explosive, shock, freezing, flash, harpoon. There's also a couple other ones that are kind of a secret that you can put onto your harpoon. So in the main missions, you break certain things in the game, such as bombs that will blow your face off if you're not quick enough. This is where mini games come into place. And I thought, holy shit, add tension on tension. And this is what you get. So you go up to a bomb and you'll see it's a red blinking bomb and you have a certain amount of time to get over to it if you're standing up, but if you're in R1 mode, which is your stealth mode, the bomb will actually uh, turn off and allow you to come up to it. You hit X and you'll see a little meter that comes on. And within this meter, you have to hit the button at the precise time within this blue zone. And if you don't do that, the bomb explodes. But if you do do it on time, you get to dismantle the bomb and get Parts. Now these parts go directly into your agony bolts. So once you encounter some agony bolts in the game, such as like the electricity one, you can remake those by getting parts from the bombs or some other weapons that are thrown on the ground from bosses, but I'll get into that, you know, later. I don't actually give away too much. So the upgrade system in this is very, very dense. I absolutely love it. I mean, for me personally, I made sure that I could run away quickly. I also made sure that my shotgun and my sniper rifle were super powerful. Uh, this, I, I would say that this, the sniper rifle comes into play uh, around mission 6, I believe, and it is super powerful, but very, very tricky to use. I know a lot of people when they first played this game, uh, you know, demo booths at, at cons and whatnot, they said that the control system like for aiming was horrible, and I even thought that, but that's something you can upgrade and it gets so much better as you upgrade it. I think that was kind of the point of the game to make it difficult for you to aim. I mean, yes, it's an annoyance at the beginning of the game because your gun's like, oh, eventually upgrade that. That's my my idea of a good game. I would do that, upgrade those, do it. 
Let's just get into the boss battles really quick here because I don't want to give too much away. I want it to be surprises for you guys because like at this point in time, I'll tell you, if you're a fan of survival horror and Resident Evil 4, this is a must own. This is a must own game if you love Resident Evil 4. I definitely, definitely, definitely suggest you buy it. Now, it's not for everyone, but I'll get to my score in a second, but the boss battles are exactly what you would hope for in a game such as this. I can't say that it was like a mind-blowing experience, like I've never seen this in survival horror, but I would say the boss battles are on par with something like Resident Evil 4, Dead Space 1 and 2. I really did enjoy the boss battles in this, and I'm not gonna give too much away about them. I would say that there's some frustrating moments within the boss battles, but you'll overcome those very quickly. I mean, it's one of those aspects of like, what the fuck do I do right now? You'll s you'll slowly realize what you need to do. And then once you realize that, it's more of a challenge based thing and you just have to take your time. So yes, boss battles, I give a thumbs up. I really enjoyed those in the game. As for level design, Diego on Twitter, and I'll say exactly what he said. How linear is the game? Is there any incentive to look around and go back and forth or is it just straightforward so i wouldn't say that it is super linear i would say that it's a cross between uh it's almost like a splinter cell game like splinter cell blacklist allowed you to go multiple routes this does have multiple routes but is not as much as like say that splinter cell game i would say that the incentive to go back would be these little statues and these little statues are hidden all over the open uh, missions. So when you're in the missions, you crack those bad boys open, they drop keys, and you're wondering what are the keys for? Well, the keys aren't necessarily for doors within the missions. They're actually for this bonus area within your save area. So like I said, you go into the mirrors, but in one of the other rooms, it slowly will open up as you progress. You'll see a giant wall of, of morgue, like the morgue is there, and you'll see a giant wall of, of caskets and you kind of can open each one of them like a tomb and each door will have a key and each key you have to find within the mission so yes you do want to go back to that morgue because when you open those things you'll get things like extra health extra green gel to upgrade your things so yes there's incentive to find those things but I, I didn't find myself like going back I mean there were some areas where I could go back and figure out like why was this door locked at the beginning of the game but I personally didn't do it, but it is there. So I'm happy to say that it is there. My overall score for The Evil Within, and I thought long and hard about this, I had such a great time with this game. Even though I wouldn't say it's the most original game, I did enjoy the story. I still think to this, you know, the second I'm filming this that I, I wish the graphics were a little bit better. It felt a little bit rushed in terms of the graphics. Music, I, I, I don't even remember hearing any of it. It's more of an atmosphere game. There are moments of music, you know, string moments where it's, it's kind of playing with your emotions with the music, but overall the psychology of the game is what I found interesting and it definitely builds up this amazing franchise to come. I'm very excited about the sequel to this game. It's, it's a very good stepping stone. I give it a solid, solid, solid 7.5 out of 10. There are not too many things that really stood out to me that I thought, whoa, this is like groundbreaking, this is next gen, this is a, the future of survival horror. I would say that it would be the next book in the creator of Resident Evil's arsenal. I think that he, he really had this vision of a game, he put it out there, this is what we got. Unfortunately, some of the aspects of what he came up with were from his past games, and unfortunately it doesn't look and it doesn't necessarily have the best animations, but again, I have to say, if you're a fan of survival horror, it's definitely a game you want to check out. Don't let it pass you by. Enjoy it for this, this, this Halloween stretch that we have. There are definitely some very good scares in the game, definitely some very good boss battles in the game, but overall, I give it a 7.5. I really did enjoy it. I can't recommend it for absolutely everybody. If you're like a fan of Uncharted and you just like action adventure games, I don't see you enjoying it as, as much as Uncharted. You have to be a fan of Resident Evil. You have to be a fan of kooky, you know, Japanese stories that make absolutely no sense almost up until the end of the game. So that's my review of The Evil Within. Thank you so much for for tuning in it means so much to me thank you for commenting below and i please do ask that if you're new to the channel subscribe i have all sorts of reviews i just did this week 
And I really, again, appreciate everything. So thank you so much again to Bethesda. And thank you so much for tuning in. Let me know in the ender bar because I want to know this. You're probably going to play this if you're a fan of survival horror. I hope you do. But what is your favorite survival horror game of all time up until this one? Let me know in the, uh, in the comments because I will read them and I will comment back. I love you guys a lot. It means so much to me. Next review coming is the horrific, scary as shit Drive Club. Stay tuned for that. Love you lots. Thank you so much, by the way, to ANC Games for supplying the Drive Club copy down there. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out for that review. It's gonna... You think the evil's within this? No. Evil's down in the disc over there. The fucking evils of the gaming industry are down there. Will you be able to live with yourself knowing what I'm gonna make you do?